Father, you gave us your son. You gave your son to this world, that he would enter into this world, that he would take on human flesh, that he would live among us, and that he would live a perfect life, perfectly qualified to go to a cross and be the innocent substitute in the place of all of those who had put their trust in him. Lord, I pray that as we spend time looking at him and at your word today, that you would grant us your grace, that we could see him rightly. We could know him to be your son. And I pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Well, this is the time in our service where we come to remember Jesus around his table. It's a place and a time for Christians to remember the person of Jesus and the work that he did on behalf of all of those who would put their trust in him. In a few moments, we're going to be taking a small wafer and a bit of juice. And these are symbols of the body and the blood of Christ that was shed on behalf of all of those who would put their trust in him. To help us do that today, we're going to be looking at a passage in which a centurion demonstrates saving faith. So if you have your Bibles, would you turn to Luke chapter 7? We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 9 together. The setting here again is that Jesus has just finished teaching the Sermon on the Mount. He is in the city of Capernaum. And the focus of Luke's story is a Roman centurion. Our passage tells us some background things about this centurion that's helpful to us as we remember Christ today. First thing we see as we look at verse 2 is that this was a man of good character. And we see that because he had a slave that he esteemed very highly. He had a slave for whom he had a very high regard. Most centurions had no regard for their slaves. In fact, they considered their slaves to be expendable. They didn't extend any rights to their slaves, and they were immune from any prosecution if they killed their slaves. So they treated them very badly, but this man esteemed his slave. So he was a man of good character. We also see in this passage that he had a high regard for God's law. We see that in verse 5. As a Gentile, he thought so highly of God's law that he had a synagogue built for the people of God so they could be taught the word of God. He actually financed and had that synagogue built himself. And then back up in Luke chapter 7, verse 2, Luke tells us that this centurion, the man who had a very high regard for God's law, the man who considered his own slave very highly, he also had a slave that was very sick, and that slave was about to die. These things help bring into focus two things about this man as we remember Christ today. The things that we want to remember and see about this man is what he understood about Jesus and what he understood about himself. We begin to see what he understood about Jesus as you look at verse 3. He understood that Jesus was indeed the Son of God. His slave is sick, and so he sent some Jewish elders asking Jesus to come and save the life of his slave to actually save the life of his slave. Note that he didn't ask Jesus to come and take a look at his slave and see what he could do. His request was to save the life of his slave. He knew that Jesus wasn't like any other man. He knew that Jesus had within himself the power to save the life of his own slave. He knew that and he understood that. But if we drop down to verse 7, we understand that he, he understands more than just Jesus himself possessing the power. We understand that he knows that Jesus' words have that same power in itself. He says through his servants and his friends who go to Jesus, say the word and my servant will be healed. The centurion understood that what is unique to God is the ability to bring something to pass simply by declaring it. He knew that Jesus as a son of God could accomplish whatever he pleased simply by speaking the word. So he understood that Jesus was clearly the Son of God, but he also understood the implications of his own sin. He knew he was a sinner, and he knew his sin had implications. We start to see that in verse 3 as well. We see that when he wants to ask Jesus to come to see him and come to heal his slave, he doesn't go himself. Instead, he sends some Jewish elders to Jesus. And verse 7 tells us why he did this. He did this because of what he understood about himself. He understood that he was not worthy to come to Jesus. He knew that he was a sinner, so he sent to Jesus the men who were supposed to be the religious leaders of the people of Israel. 
And his conviction in this area only grew. If we back up to verse 6, we see that once he understands that Jesus is coming to him, he sends his friends to Jesus. And he says to them, to Jesus through his friends, Lord, do not trouble yourself further, for I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. Not only was he not worthy to come to Jesus, but he was not worthy for Jesus to come to him. With all of his goodness, he was a man of high character in the way he viewed his slave. With all of his goodness and his high valuation of God's word that he would build a synagogue, he knew something. He knew that his sin had disqualified him from fellowship with Christ. We get to verse 9, we see what Jesus thinks about this man, what he thinks about this situation. Jesus says, not even in Israel have I found such great faith. What Jesus is telling us is that this man understood something. What he understood about Jesus being the son of God and what he understood about his own sin and how that disqualifies him from fellowship with God is something that is so profound that a person cannot come to possess that by themselves. Even if that person has all the benefits that come with being a Jew. That understanding must be given to them. It must be given to them as a gift. The Lord's table is to be celebrated by those who actually do possess that faith. It takes faith to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. It takes faith to believe that you're a sinner and that your, your sin separates you from God. And it takes faith to believe that Jesus, when he went to a cross, he accomplished what we could not do for ourselves. That is to satisfy God's wrath against everybody who would put their trust in him. That's what we want to celebrate Jesus as today. We want to celebrate him as that one, the Son of God who did those things. So if you are a follower of Christ, if you are one who possesses that faith, I encourage you, as the elements come to you, take them and hold them and consider Jesus' identity as the Son of God, that he would enter into this world and he would go to a cross so that you could be reconciled to God. He would pay your penalty for you by absorbing God's wrath against you in his own body on the cross. When your heart is prepared, take the elements on your own. If you're here this morning and you don't possess that faith, you need to understand something very simply. That faith is available to you if you will humble yourself and cry out to the Lord to give you the faith to believe, to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is the one who does have the right to, to rule over you and to be your master and your Lord, and that that is a much better rule than your rule is over yourself. I'll be available after the service at the table out front. You can seek out any of the other elders, or the ones who are in the row next to you, any of us would love to tell you what a benefit it is to live under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So men, would you come and serve us? And then I'll come and close our time together in prayer.